Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight at the Dalhousie campus. Let me begin with acknowledging that Dalhousie is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We also acknowledge the histories, contributions, and legacies of African Nova Scotian people and communities who have been here for more than 400 years. I am Dr. Anya Waite. I'm the Scientific Director and CEO of the Ocean Frontier Institute, and I'm also Associate Vice President of Research for Ocean Research here at Dalhousie. I'll be your host and moderator for this evening's Open Dialogue Live, Accelerating Ocean Research at Dalhousie. So just to start us off, the ocean, as we know, absorbs more carbon than all the rainforests combined. And yet, often, the ocean is missing from key conversations, particularly policy conversations. And it is not there when we need to talk about climate action. So working with national and international partners, Dalhousie researchers and their partners have a plan. And that is to envision a global research, research collaboration that will transform climate action, to develop new technologies and new practices that will create a robust, equitable, and just ocean economy. So tonight's conversation will explore how Dalhousie researchers and their partners are advancing ocean research and bringing it to the center of global climate action. Please join me in welcoming our very special guests for this conversation. First, to my left here, Dr. Mike Smith, who is Acting Dean at the Faculty of Management and Professor at the School of Information Management. Mike is also, and I'm very pleased to tell you this, Deputy Scientific Director for the Ocean Frontier Institute, for which I'm very grateful, and Principal for the Atlantic Regional Association of the Canadian Integrated Ocean Observing System. He studies the intersection of people, information, and technology, drawing on information and computer science to explore how we use emerging technologies to benefit people, organizations, and society. And much of his recent work is on ensuring that ocean, environment, and climate data are available, accessible, and usable. And to Mike's left is Dr. Kate Sharon. She's a professor at the School for Resource and Environmental Studies and also an environmental social scientist with research focusing on the human dimensions of landscape change, particularly in contexts of sustainable agric agriculture, renewable energy, and coastal climate adaptation, obviously key in the ocean conversation. She also looks towards including increasing engagement with ecosystem services, particularly the more immaterial categories that are cultural or relation, relational in nature. And those are ones that often we as natural scientists are not that good at understanding. So it's great to have someone um, with Kate's um, expertise here uh, at Dalhousie and that she's willing to work with us is also excellent. Um, Kate also integrates secondary data sets such as those from social media into her work, developing landscape culturomics, which is an interesting word, maybe I'll ask you what that means exactly, for application in decision-making contexts such as social impact assessments. So thank you, Kate, for being here. Um, the third panelist was supposed to be Dr. Katya Fennell. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to join us today, but I just wanted to say that Katya and her team are absolutely foundational. Her work is uh, of the top international caliber. She models ocean carbon and ocean biogeochemistry, and she's a key colleague here at Dalhousie, working with many of us um, across the social, natural, and applied sciences. And you'll hear a little bit about her work today, I hope, through this conversation, even though she can't be with us. And finally, last but not least, Dr. Will Burt, who is an alum from class of 2016 um, and the chief ocean scientist at Dartmouth-based Planetary Technologies, which is a global leader for ocean-based carbon dioxide removal technologies, one particular called Ocean Alkalinity Enhancement. And Will is responsible for expanding Planetary's global scientific collaborations, guiding technology development, and generally being able um, to be among the leading scientific industry voices in this new and very exciting and rapidly moving marine field. Due to its uh, potential, this is growing at a, at a pace which um, we're, we're struggling really to even get our heads around. At, at, so, so great to have you here today, Will, and thank you um, for coming back from all your international travels to, um, to land here to talk at home uh, to your home crowd. So thank you. 
So what we're going to do tonight is we'll start um, with remarks from each of our panelists, and we'll then we'll have a little bit of a conversation between us and them for uh, the first half hour or so. And then we're going to open floor to questions for our um, in-person and online visitors. So please, I believe there's a QR co code, and you can register your um, question if you like. Um, and we hope to have at least 20 minutes of discussion with the audience. So please... Uh, Get your questions ready and uh, give us give us what you what you can. We'd love to respond to your to your thoughts. We may not be able to answer all the questions depending on how many um, we receive, but we'd like to try. So we have a lot that we want to get together to, to get through tonight. So let's begin. And Mike, over to you. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, for, for being here. It's, it's great to see you, and for those of us joining uh, online, I can't see you, but I hope you can see me, and thank you for being here as well. Um, look, I'll, I'll just briefly introduce a little bit about what I care about, and that is um, ocean research at, at Dalhousie is a, a huge piece of our, our research, um, and it's internationally known for its expertise in, in ocean research. And sitting here surrounded by the offices of the Department of Oceanography, it might be heretical to say that uh, the Department of Oceanography is necessary but not sufficient to tackle the ocean climate challenge that we have, right? We need that expertise, but actually we need research and expertise across the university to tackle these, these urgent ocean climate challenges, right? Uh, Anya talked about how the ocean uh, is, is saving humanity from the bus that is climate change, but the ocean's not unchanged by that. And so, um, yes, we need more observation. Yes, we need ocean modeling like some of the work Katja does to better predict and understand what's happening and what's going to happen with the ocean, but we have to branch beyond that, right? And we are at Dalhousie, which is why it's exciting. Uh, we need engineers to develop new sensors uh, and new platforms for deploying those sensors to the ocean. And uh, we need lawyers to help us understand the policy and regulatory frameworks in which we operate and ensure that we're informing those with science. Uh, we need people who understand entrepreneurship and innovation to help us understand how we take the ocean uh, innovation that's happening at Dal and, and bring it to, to the world through the marketplace. We, we need social scientists who are understanding how is a changing ocean changing people uh, and how are people responding to that and, and how does information get from the pens of scientists into the minds of policymakers. And all of these pieces um, re rely on understanding the fundamental human relationship to the ocean. And if you doubt that it exists, try to buy oceanfront property in Nova Scotia, right? <laughs> we, we feel connected to the ocean and understanding how and why embracing indigenous ways of knowing and relating to the ocean is a big part of a complete ocean research platform. We need people in the financial markets to understand how the carbon credit system is going to work and how it's going to be based on science. We need um, people who do data, if I may say so, to <laughs> ensure that the data that we're collecting to inform our understanding of a changing ocean is also helping to inform and change society and a tool for international collaboration. And so all of these pieces are ocean research at Dalhousie. There's beautiful labs, there's brilliant scientists, but there's so much more and I'm excited to, to talk about that tonight. Thanks so much, Mike. And I will remember the st statement, we need lawyers. <laughs> Kate, I'll hand it over to you. Yes, thank you so much. It's a, it's a real delight to be here, and I appreciate being asked to do this. As a social scientist, I don't come in this building very often, and it's, it's nice. And uh, welcome to everybody who's, uh, who's calling in from home. Um, you know, as a social scientist, I spend most of my time on land, but uh, I, I'm looking at the coasts quite a lot these days, and I want to say that the coastlines are really our front lines on cl climate change. But one of the things I think that we don't get is that coastlines aren't lines. They're actually um, incredibly complex and really, really layered spaces. And that makes it interesting, but it makes it challenging. Right, so think about jurisdictions. So there's a lot of jurisdictional overlap at the coast. What we can do and who tells us what we can do differs depending on kind of where you are in relation to say the high water line or the low water line. And even if you can understand that, those things are changing themselves with sea level rise, right? And so then you think about um, use, land, land use, water use. Um, Nova Scotia is a remarkable microcosm of all the things that you might want to do 
uh, on the ocean or coast, right? We want to fish and we want to uh, generate energy and we want to have vacations and maybe retire. And it means that our lifestyles and our livelihoods are all kind of layered into those spaces, right? And so this also can become really complicated. Um, it's also a microcosm in terms of challenges because of our kind of geologic diversity. There's lots of different coastal types as you go around, and that's not my expertise, but what I do know is that when I talk to people on the coast about what the options are that they have uh, in the face of climate change, they go, well, that might work there, but it won't work here. So there's this amazing granularity to the way we think about the coast, in part because of this practical difference in what the coast looks like. But then, you know, if you get to the bit that I do a lot more of, it's around perceptions and values, right? As Mike just said, try to buy some kind of coastal property, and you know that in general, we have some pretty strong feelings about oceans and coasts in this jurisdiction and in most, to be honest. But those are also quite singular and they're massively overlapping, right? So uh, one person looks at a, a piece of ocean or coast and they want to fish or innovate, right? And another person looks at that same thing and all they want is peace and quiet. And they want it the way it always has been. And a third person looks at that and sees not a place, but kin, right? Uh, where there's a reciprocal responsibility uh, and relationship, right? And all of those matter. So, all of this makes climate mitigation, adaptation, decision, and especially implementation extremely challenging. And in, in Nova Scotia, we've got, say, Cove and places that are about scaling up, say, ocean innovation. But I think we also need to scale up some of the social innovation. As a social scientist, there's this idea which we call the social imaginary. And it's this thing, where basically it's our shared understanding of what's possible and desirable in a given time. And we kind of, kind of have a shared understanding of like, this is okay, that's not okay, that's too much, this is too big, that's too small, right? And, and we, we have this, we tend to get stuck in what we have right now, rather than thinking about what could come next. Um, and it's almost as if what we have now we deserve to keep, just because it's what we have now, right? When in fact the transition uh, over the next few decades is going to be massive and we're going to need to ex accept some changes there. And I think about, you know, climate mitigation. You think about shifting towards something like offshore wind in this jurisdiction, layering one more use, massive social challenges in doing that from a pos pos position of, you know, acceptability of, um, among other things, right? But then think about adaptation. Right? In, in an adaptation context, you know, not only are we going to have that kind of more crowded set of uses, but the uses that we already have. So we're used to seawalls to protect ourselves in the face of climate change and sea level rise. They're not going to go on this journey much longer with us. Right? So really, we have options like you know, shifting dike lands back to salt marshes in some areas, like have it happening in the, in the Bay of Fundy. And we also um, might have to take some big steps back from the coast, as we're seeing in some places after Hurricane um, Fiona. Right? And all of that is really challenging. And so these kinds of actions will require cultural change, and they're going to require social innovation, as well as a commitment to kind of a just and equitable transition as well as transformation. And as Mike has indicated, a lot of that work is happening here in Dalhousie already, and we hope to do more. Thank you. Thanks so much. Shared understanding, and was it social imagining? Social, um, social imaginary. The social imaginary, yeah. that's a great term. We're gonna have to yeah. think about that. <laughs> um, Will, I'm gonna hand it to you for your opening remarks. Thanks, Anya. Um, yeah, it's, it's so great to be here. As, as Anya mentioned off the top, I'm a, a Dal alum from about 10 years ago. I used to remember walking out these doors. This used to be outside uh, with boxes full of gear to go get on the Coast Guard ship to go study uh, the Scotian Shelf. My PhD was uh, a lot about ocean acidification, which as many people here probably know is a serious problem um, that spans sort of the global oceans. Um, and now I work for a company that works on ocean, ocean solutions. Uh, very exciting to make that transition. And the reason my company exists is that, in large part, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, came out and said, you know, we need to drastically cut our emissions. We've been saying that for three decades now. But it's not going to be enough anymore. We have to also actively remove the carbon dioxide that we've been putting up into the atmosphere for the last 200 years. And we have to actually do that at an alarming 
rate. By 2050, it's on the order of like 10 billion tons of CO2 needs to be actively removed from the atmosphere and put somewhere. Now, as an ocean scientist, sometimes it can be hard, especially as an ocean chemist, to find applied research for what you do um, as, a, as a graduate student. <clears throat> and now we've got this ocean chemistry problem that is absolutely immense. And so companies like ours have cropped up to try and tackle this problem. Can we create an industry that is twice the size of the current oil industry in the next 25 years in order to try and actively remove this carbon, and at the same time, with a process that we talk about at Planetary, tackle this problem of ocean acidification. So that's what this company is founded on, the concept of ocean alkalinity enhancement. And the way it works is you basically put an antacid into the ocean, and when that antacid dissolves, it neutralizes some of the CO2, some of that acid in the seawater. And that essentially creates a vacuum where more carbon dioxide can come out from the atmosphere and move into the ocean. The really amazing thing about this ocean chemistry problem is that the oceans cover 70% of the globe's surface. And so the amount of carbon already stored in the ocean, because the ocean has been naturally taking up <clears throat> CO2 for millions and millions of years, it's an immense reservoir, far dwarfing any other reservoir that exists currently. So the oceans really are the place, the logical storage place for all that excess CO2 we've put up in the atmosphere. Now, this is not a simple problem, and the people on this panel have already sort of brought this up. This is a major societal problem. This sort of solution is going to involve local communities. It's going to involve technology coming in and doing something to the ocean that people have not heard about before and that is uh that is a big big step and and then you think about that on top of the fact that any solution that is going to be relevant to help fix the climate crisis or or at least help it's going to have to get really big and that's scary too so as a private company we we have to partner with with these big academic research teams who can provide that independent review of what we're doing. Make sure what we're doing is safe, make sure that we're doing it responsibly, make sure that we're doing it with all the relevant stakeholders, including social scientists, including all the different types of people that Mike mentioned there. So being here at Dalhousie back where I was 10 years ago is really exciting for a lot of reasons and one is because the amount of capability we have here is immense and Halifax is quickly becoming a global hub for this exciting new technology there's a lot of interest coming there's a lot of excitement and um, yeah it's just a real pleasure to be back Thanks so much, Will. And yeah, that is super exciting work and work that's going to require all of us to come together to look at consequences and look at techniques and make sure things are done well. Uh, so that's, that's exciting. So I'm going to go back to you for a moment, Mike. I know that, um, you know, as Will mentioned, ocean research is accelerating at an incredibly rapid pace. And that's something we're all struggling to get our heads around at some level. Um, we're getting a lot of new data from the ocean and new data flows and new information flows. Mm. So what opportunities do you see from that going forward and what challenges do they also potentially represent for you? Mm. Uh, certainly people who know me will, will be wondering how in his opening remarks did Mike not spend the whole time talking about data? Uh, and so I'm glad that I have a chance to rectify that now. Uh, I think there's a, a couple of pieces um, that are really, really fun when we think about how data and information um, can be part of the solution here, right? I, I think one of them is around the concept of, of data and information sharing. And, and that's, l let me back up a little bit and say, Will just introduced the idea of, of ocean alkalinity enhancement, and you can imagine if you're adding something to the ocean, you really want to understand what's happening when you do that. And so you can imagine that for a, a 
let's say, a cubic kilometer of ocean, you want to know everything. You want to know what's its temperature and what's its pH and how much carbon is already there and how is the carbon changing. And uh, Will could name 30 other variables that he'd be excited about. But we'd also care about maybe we want to get some environmental DNA to find out what species from plankton to whale might be in that cubic kilometer and, and how they change over, over time. And, and all of that coming in is a massive amount of, of data, right? And, and once you have it, what do you do with it, right? Well, sure, you want to inform the original purpose for which you collected it, but there's other people who care about other things, and you should share it with them so that they can find insight into the things that they care about. And so there's a data management, data sharing piece here that I think is really exciting, and I think it's a platform for national and international collaboration, right? There was a time when you got data and you kind of held onto it and said, this is mine, and this is what makes me different and unique and special from the rest of the world because I have this data. And I think we're past that time I think we're at a time now where we say, I have this data, and if I contribute it to the data that you have, together we'll have a better shared understanding of what's actually happening in the ocean. So that's one. <laughs> the other one um, is we are collecting more and more data by volume from the ocean. I think there's other challenges with our ocean observation that I won't get into right now, um, but we do have all, all of this data, and we see in other areas of our global society that we're leveraging large amounts of data with artificial intelligence to do a whole bunch of cool and also deeply frightening stuff. And what if we took some of that machine learning expertise, and instead of using it to develop ever better chatbots, or perhaps in addition uh, and to developing better chatbots, uh, we used it to combine it with um, the ocean expertise that we have. So if we're doing ocean modeling, how do we augment our understanding of models um, with some of this machine learning uh, capabilities? How do we take data um, about uh, what's happening in a particular cubic kilometer of the ocean and see how we can build models that help our artificial intelligence models that help us better understand that that big picture. And I think that's a really exciting and growing area of research uh, and one that we're excited to undertake uh, here at, at Dal. And um, if I could put in a little plug before I finish, um, Dalhousie has proposed a project called Transforming Climate Action. I encourage you to go read about it, transformclimateaction.ca, uh, where we're asking uh, with our partners at UCAR, Laval, and Memorial for a significant federal investment in work that would dramatically elevate this kind of broad work. Uh, and that'll give you a little better picture of some of the potential that we see. Sorry for the gratuitous plug. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mike. That's interesting because you also, like Kate, talked about the net need for a shared understanding. I think that's interesting that you both um, came up with that term in your opening remarks. Um, Kate, I'm just going to go to you and ask, so shared understanding, if we think about that a little bit, um, why is it so critical that we bring in the social science and what are the key learnings that we need to make sure that what we do is grounded in justice and equity? Yeah, think, thanks very much. I think the why is is easier than the how sometimes, right? And I was sort of thinking about social science and the fact that, you know, we've got decades and decades of, of social science around there, uh, you know, in, in various areas that might be relevant. And even social scientists that weren't personally interested in climate change have had to become interested in climate change because these are the circumstances that people that they are studying are experiencing, right? And so there's been this kind of convergence. And so I don't know if it's something that is kind of endogenous or came from social science, but it's certainly where we've all landed, right? And, and of course, we know that uh, climate is human-induced, and so understanding people has got to be part of that. And social scientists have lots of different ways of doing that. You know, some, some social scientists really study kind of cognitive um, biases and basically the kind of uh, flawed mental hardware that we have for perceiving risk and uh, making decisions and and those folks would tell you that um, it's you know, frankly, we spend a lot of our time in that very emotional decision-making space, but it's even worse if people feel like they're under threat and they can feel under threat by climate change, but they can frankly also feel under threat because of what the government's trying to do to address climate change in many situations. So, so these sort of, you know, they can feel politically pressured or, you know, policy pressure. Um, there's other social scientists that are working much more on, on, on the, the, the vision of humans as rational, right? The econ more economics view. And this is like when we're doing our best, 
like when they, we got our smart hats on and we are, um, we're feeling, and the kind of decisions that we make there um, are kind of weighing um, uh, you know, pros and cons, often you know, talks about looking at cho choice architecture, changing our, you know, our physical landscapes, our policy landscapes, our, our culture, our, 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 our societal norms to kind of tweak people or nudge people in one way or another. And so it's another place where social scientists often play a role. Um, there's others who really are looking much more at human relationships and groundedness. This idea of sense of place is a, pa is a very strong driver of how people are going to respond to proposals that might change uh, the nature of the coast or you know, other places that they care about. Um, and we know that stability these days is a luxury. So, you know, sense of place does not mean that we have to try to keep things the same. Um, so researchers in the sense of place field are talking a lot now about the fact that it's a luxury to be able allowed to stay where you are, and it sure is a luxury for that place to stay the way it is, right? Mobility is the norm. And so there's researchers working on that too in that social science space. Others are looking at organizations and how organizations need to change because because of some of the systemic challenges. We think about our food system, our energy system, our, inf our transportation system. You know, it's not just all about individual choice, these rational people moving through the world, making the ideal choice. They are systemically bounded. Right, and so some, pe some researchers are working at this systemic scale to understand um, how that has to change, which is very difficult. And then there's the organizational folks who are working at that as well. And so this, this, this social science expertise is like massively transferable to, to situations like the ones that we talk about around coastal and co ocean and coastal issues. Um, and so the you know, social scientists are really worth bringing in on teams. Uh, to do around doing that kind of research, but they need to be part of those teams, right? And I think to date it has been a much more mercenary engagement often. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll just laugh, but because yeah, you know what I mean, right? It's like, oh, we need a social scientist on this team because this funding requires it, or, you know, uh, I need somebody to run my workshops for me, or something like this to convince people. How can I convince people that this is the right thing that I have invented? Right? That's, n that's not how it works. So social scientists need to really be involved um, throughout a project like that. And I think that's where transforming cl climate action is a really exciting proposal, right? Because we are. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Kate. And yeah. uh, again, that idea of systems and a shared understanding, I think, really important. And Will, we're just going to touch base again on why we need technologies to help us at a time of climate change. And if you could, I know this is a little, might be a little challenging, but just reflect for me, you have, do you have there's two sides to what you're doing. In a way, there's this, the big um, challenge around how do we save the planet, right? From, we, we're using some of the technologies you have, and you have to get those technologies right. And you also need to get the social part Right. So I wonder if you could just reflect uh, briefly for me of, you know, what technologies are needed to slow climate change, and then what are the social activities and connectivities that we're going to need to socialize those and, and get us to the right place? There's, there's no way I can answer that briefly, <clears throat> <laughs> but I will try. Uh, I'll start by saying that, Kate, I am just so excited to not be mercenaries, but, but work together on this stuff. I, I just can't wait. But um, yes, so, so what solutions do we need? We need all of them. <laughs> Honestly, I, I, I'm going to go against that in a minute, but, but the scale of the problem is, is so immense. And it's really interesting to hear you talk about keeping things like it, this, ability, this stability, stability, like wanting to have that stability. Well, we've been in this sort of stable holding pattern with things are just rosy and we're gonna keep going the way it is for such a long time, but we're in this really scary place now where um, we just have to do something. Um, I mean, honestly, from the bottom of my heart, I, I, don't, I wish that my company didn't exist. I wish that re emissions reduction was something that we were actually doing you know, deep and meaningful cuts to and, and we could feel as if that was gonna get us there. Um, but it's just not, and so, um, you know, that's why I'm sitting here today, so I am grateful for it in that regard. But, it, you know, we are going to need more than ocean alkalinity enhancement. We're going to need more than mangroves, more than forests. Um, 
because you know, no one solution will get us there. Now, at the same time, I will make a sort of scientific plug that as a chemist, I'm highly biased. I believe that these sorts of solutions should be focused on chemistry. <clears throat> it is a fundamentally chemical problem that we have, this CO2 in the atmosphere and needing to store it somewhere. A lot of technologies are proposing to alter biological systems in order to get to the same outcome. And they, that, you know, that's scientifically proven that it, that it can do that. But that, to me, is a, is a bit of a more daunting task. You know, an intentional change to the biological system um, can have a lot of side effects. Now, a chemical change to the system can have unintended consequences. There's no doubt about that. And that is what a lot of our research needs to dig deep into. What, what are the unknown unknowns, as we often say? But fundamentally, chemistry is a lot more predictable than, than biology. I say that because my older sister is a biologist, and I like to poke fun of her about that. <laughs> but it, it, it's true. And so um, that, that is my sort of stance on, on the, the breadth of all these technologies and where they are. Now, the social component, um, I, uh, as Anya sort of alluded to, I'm now, you know, Planetary has projects here uh, in Canada and also in the UK. We are starting to speak to communities. I was speaking to the community on the radio this morning in some way. Um, it's, it's a really challenging thing for someone who's trained as a marine chemist to, to do. And um, in, in some ways, I have to be front and center because I have to be there to make sure we talk about the technology in, a, in an accurate way, but I also am way out of my depths when it comes to understanding the deep complexity of how people react, how people perceive, and, and things like that. So um, it's going to be, I think, you know, people in my space know that this is actually quickly going to become the biggest problem we have or close to it. You know, the scientific problem is going to be big, you know, the uncertainties and data and all that fun stuff. But there is going to be a major social challenge ahead of us. And I, I do I will say that, you know, our, our main project is uh, intended to be here in Halifax. And so one of the things I would love to do is engage every type of person um, living in, in this patch of the coast to, you know, work with them, talk through concerns, learn about how they might see the project differently from me, how they think they could, you know, help how they could uh, add to the sort of research we're doing, um, because you know that's that's what we're going to have to do, and and yeah, it's no easy feat, but you know one step at a time. So there's been one um, question that came through, and thank you for those of you who are putting your questions up. I am looking through them, so don't f feel like they're going into the ether. Um, and those who have come in, if you'd like, we can also try and answer them offline if you don't, we don't get to them um, in this session. So what controls for ocean alkalinity enhancement should be in place, economic or otherwise? I thought that's an interesting question from the room. What controls should be in place? Um, well, there are there are a number of them already. I think there are there are laws against putting things in the sea, um, and so that that is you know fundamentally going to stop us from doing something rogue. I mean, these things have happened in the past. I'm I'm from British Columbia originally. There have been rogue experiments that have been done, <clears throat> and um, and so, you know, our work actually, you know, please go check it out on the website, I won't get into it, but we, we work with existing wastewater streams. And a, an existing wastewater stream, like a water treatment plant, has a permit. Those, those facilities know what can and can't be put in the ocean in terms of metals, in terms of solids, and things like that. And so what we propose to do is work within those permits and work within, and actually go well above and beyond those permits because there's also, in places like Canada, fairly strict guidelines about what is, an, you know, environmental quality standards do exist. And so, you know, those numbers are out there and we don't want to bump up against them. We want to stay way, way below them. But, you know, these sorts of, these sorts of you know, guardrails are in place. And then, you know, a key guardrail for us is going to be what the scientific community explores and investigates. You know, these things are coming out every month now. It turns out that there is a limit to how much 
of this you can do, and you have to make sure that <clears throat> you you understand that and stay within it. So you know, it's a new field, and so there aren't enough guardrails, and, and that is something that's going to be a problem. So they will come because this this industry is moving quickly, and um, and the public's going to need to see uh, clear regulations about it. Absolutely. And um, just for interest, the, the Ocean Frontier Institute is also working on the financial side of this to talk to um, insurance and the banks to make sure that when they are jumping now very quickly into ocean carbon markets, into the car uh, active carbon market, that they are aware that the ocean is a place where you need to engage intensely with research and observers if you're going to get it right. And so we're deep into that conversation, and it's a very interesting one. Um, Mike, there was a question for you about data. Um, the question remains, how do we align global observation efforts to conform to the necessary sharing and accessibility standards within a reasonable time frame, i.e. faster than the decades we we're talking about? <laughs> it's nice that it's an easy data question. Um, moving towards standards and accessibility at a global scale. Um, uh, I guess the first thing I would say is the world does not suffer from a lack of standards, right? We have the standards. The Global Ocean Observing System has defined essential ocean variables and has talked about them at, at length. Uh, there's more work to be done on the standards front in, in terms of new um, ways of measuring and new science. Like, we're, it's not a solved problem, but tremendous progress has been done on that front. Uh, and so the question is, uh, how do you get people to engage in the standardization and accessibility work? Because there's a, really a fundamental problem at work there, right? And that is that the work that I do individually to make my data standardized and accessible benefits people who are not me, right? It benefits the community in a global sense. And that, like, that's a really hard problem to overcome because even the most altruistic people in the world have significant resource limitations and, and have to sometimes make decisions that they might not otherwise make be, because of that. And so um, the, the notion is that if enough people engage in the accessible and standardization of data, then the benefit that you get by participating in that is, is shared by everyone, right? It's not you doing the work and the community benefiting, it's the community doing the work and the community benefiting. So how do we kind of crack that first phase, right? How do we get from the, the, the past the point where I'm doing the work and other people are benefiting? And I think um, there, there's two ways, right? One is uh, a community sourced approach to data standardization, and that's something that we're working on. And, and the other is, um, uh, in, in, uh, 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 I'm trying to think of the right verb to use here, an invigorization, is that a word? Um, sure. but, <laughs> but, but an investment in the sharing of data for the sake of doing it, right? Um, and I, I think that that piece around saying, we're going to support you to share your data. We're not gonna ask you to write a science proposal to advance the state of knowledge, we're just gonna ask you to share your data, to prime the pump and, and get that data community working for everyone. It's entirely theoretical if that would work or not, but the thing that we have going for us is generally, scientists do want to be part of a larger community, and they do want data to be accessible and standardized. We're not fighting against people who are fiercely opposed to that, that kind of activity. Aligning observation efforts is harder because um, the people who make decisions about what to observe uh, hold the resources, and so I don't have uh, an initial sense on, on that, but I, I do think that, that one path forward for addressing observation gaps is to form, is to build international collaborations to lift observations in regions of the ocean that we know are important, right? We're here in the North Atlantic, so it's selfish but also accurate to say that the North Atlantic is very important to the overall ocean system. Um, and so what can we do with international collaborators to do something like at the scale of the International Space Station, right? Like not uh, I'm going out and doing my mission for my research, but what do we do together that's a huge lip, lift for, for ocean observation? Um, and, and so the North Atlantic Carbon Observatory is one um, proposed approach that would bring together nations to contribute the work that they're already doing into a collaborative approach to deciding around observation priorities. And I, I think that that kind of thing is a starting place. And I think we should do something like the North Atlantic Carbon Observatory as an exemplar to see how that works out. Uh, but we, you're right, we have to do it fast. Like we do not have the luxury of, of a whole lot of time. So we have to, 
to, to pilot quickly and, and, scale as, and scale rapidly, which is exciting and terrifying. So thank you very much for that, Mike. And um, I think the word scale is one I'd like to just run by us, um, this, the whole group here, because we're talking about communities living on the coast impacted by climate change and having to adapt. We're talking about mitigation, which may happen on the coast, on the continental shelf, in the open ocean. And then we've just heard about um, the possibility of working across an entire ocean basin or globally to work at the scale at which the ocean actually starts to absorb carbon at a climate scale. So how do we cross these scales when people live on the coast and carbon is absorbed in the big, deep, open ocean? So I'm going to start with you, Kate, and ask you to address that question. <laughs> yeah, when you started talking about scale, I was thinking about scale of thinking. Um, as my as the first thing because um, and so it doesn't exactly speak to going to the deep oceans but the, this idea of the way that we think is very much at our at our own scale our, our ourselves and our and our now so uh, very small spatial scale very small temporal scale right and if we do anything we kind of think about you know what's come behind a lot more than what's ahead and I think what we're seeing now in many areas of research is that we need to really shift the script on that because we need Need to think about our the future generations and kind of the decisions that we're making that are going to influence them and really have kind of a, in our minds have that that generation at the table but the other thing that i don't think that we think about very often and we have to is the decisions that we make on a local scale and say maintaining our stasis if we reject one technology or another in our cherished spaces it generally pushes um, the impacts of that the, the, the impact the decision propagates with people less powerful and less rich and further away. So if we decide we don't want this renewable energy near home and then uh, there are other places that are going to feel the impact of the sea level rise or the fact of, of fossil fuel ex extraction that is keeping Nova Scotia's energy system going, right? And so we have this sense of, so when I think about scale, the first thing that hit me was sort of thinking about how do we rescale our thinking? right, to fit so that our lifestyles and our livelihoods fit our circumstances, and, and right now that they don't. Um, and so I, I'm going to hand over to somebody else to <laughs> fill in the rest of that equation. So, Will, let's go to you next. Yeah, I, I think about scale in a very different way. Shocker. <laughs> um, the way I think about scale the most is that the climate crisis is a global one. It's a global problem. And companies like mine propose projects and solutions in local communities. So there's a massive mismatch there. We're trying to do something for the greater good uh, of the world, but the people who take the risk in these projects are local communities. Um, and that, that, that's going to be a problem that we face as well. Um, but I kind of choose to flip that on its head, because if you go about this the right way, and I don't know exactly how to do it yet we're still working on it but you know transparency uh, at every level um, building these projects with communities instead of in communities and, um, and and taking it in a you know stepwise approach do a bit of learning go back look at the data and uh, and then go back again and, and try and scale you know bit by bit incrementally I think if you do it like that it actually becomes an opportunity in a local community. You know, I, I live here in Halifax. I have this dream of uh, the Halifax waterfront and a, and a placard that sits there on the harbor. And um, there's a, a clock ticking up with every ton of removal that we do uh, at our project site. And you can't really see it because it's chemistry and that's a real shame, but it's happening, I promise. And the reason that that thing is ticking up is because there's a, a verifiable model that the you know, Dow researchers helped us build, and um, it's gone through peer review and all that good stuff. But, you know, to go and see that, I think would be amazing. I think people would be like, wow, that is such an exciting thing that I can't really see it, but, you know, it's, it's happening, and, and there's actually, CO, you know, carbon dioxide being sucked out of the air and, and stored in the ocean. So I think that, you know, as long as we do this right and we do it incrementally, but yet somehow super fast. I'm not sure how to make that work, but, but you know, we're going to move as fast as we can responsibly. And I think, you know, we can sort of bridge the gap with that sort of scale problem that we have. Can I leave 
spin on that? Because I was just thinking about how exciting that sounds as an installation, right? And I was thinking about there's a work by a, a researcher, A.R. Siders, who's in Maryland, I think, and, and, and she talks about the need to get away from a deficit way of thinking about this transformation. And she's talking a lot about managed retreat at the coast, so she's talking about, uh, you know, that people have necessarily, they just, they think about the loss that they're going to face, right? And we have this, you know, there's lots of theory around loss aversion that we, that we are really worried more about a loss than, than, about, than we want an equivalent gain. And she says we need to reframe it, we need to flip the script there, and we have to give people something to want, right? And so she talks about uh, in the U.S., what if we kind of told people they could have a national seashore? What if you could walk from Maine to Key West or whatever it's called, all on public land? I mean, would that be amazing? And so this idea, giving people something to want, and, and that's a, I think that's a really important way to kind of scale our brains to the problem. Yeah. What a great vision. Um, so there's been a few questions coming in. Um, one, one question was around what types of activities, what types of research is needed for this, and how can students engage? And a related question um, is, well, you know, the, the panelists have described an all-hands-on-deck situation. How can we, as the public or an average citizen, what can we actually do? And um, so maybe I'd ask each one of you to speak to what's the disciplinary background that students would need to sort of engage in the work that you do? And I, in many cases, it's a very broad. And then second of all, what can we as citizens do um, to come together and, and take action? I'll start with you, Mike. Oh, thank you for that. Um, so for the specific things that I do, there's a, a couple of pieces um, that, that really come in. One is um, uh, information management and uh, the School of Information Management or the Department of Information Science at Dell does that uh, does that very well. It's all about data and information. Um, I'm a computer scientist by training originally, so it can't go wrong with a strong computer science degree. Um, and I, um, of course, in in the faculty of management. Um, all the things that you care about need to be managed, right? And, and so building the skills around working with people, uh, affecting change in organizations, um, I think a, a management degree is also a really good, good fit for, for that kind of work. Um, but I would say more broadly to the question, I started by taking an institutional perspective, and I believe that down to my bones, that um, if you're hearing this and saying, wow, the ocean is essential for climate, and I'm worried about climate, and I want to take some kind of action, I should become an oceanographer. Um, I, God bless. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that's fantastic. But if that's not where your passion lies, uh, and you're doing it out of some sense of obligation, I would say to you, find where your passion lies and find a way to uh, advance in ocean research, right? Because if you care about engineering uh, or history or management or computer science, uh, I promise you that you will find someone at Dalhousie who cares about that thing in the context of oceans. You will find uh, a center on marine law. You will find uh, a center that looks at how changing coastlines are going to impact tourism in Nova Scotia you will find uh, scientists who are looking at how do we put um, autonomous vehicles in the ocean to dramatically scale up the data we're collecting. You will find all kinds of people doing all kinds of cool stuff in and around salty water, including oceanographers who are wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Kate. <laughs> yeah. Um, I started my career as a geographer, which is the, uh, in, in, an ultimate kind of generalist discipline, and it's a lot of fun, and you learn about the social, kind of geomorphological, climatological, so you learn about a lot of different things, and then you generally kind of drift one way or the other, and I drifted one way and the other. <laughs> and, uh, and so to be honest, I think, it, you know, I'm in a school for resource and environmental studies and we're a graduate only unit. We, um, we convert a lot of people from one discipline to another. So we have an MES program, for instance, and it's as common for me to have somebody with an undergraduate in science that is doing a learning social science under me as there is with somebody who has an undergraduate in social science. And so, you know, we kind of can take anybody on that journey if you're motivated. And as I said, you know, um, just 
just because of the nature of the world now, climate change and, and oceans where we are, it tends to kind of infiltrate all of those fields. And so there's a lot you can you can you can get there from wherever, right? You know, and, and Mike's right about that. Um, and I think the piece about what we can do as citizens that I am that's kind of popping into my head in this moment is around political will. Now we know that political will is all about electorate will. And 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 we have to be willing to uh, face change and to accept to, to onboard the burdens of our lifestyles. For instance, we need to um, be willing to uh, to kind of own that and bring that into our own spaces so it doesn't push out. We need to um, be willing to face regulation. We just recently had the Coastal Protection Act, long awaited. Um, in Nova Scotia, pushed back for an, a, a public consultation. That sounds great, but it's just that it's been pushed away from regulatory development, and that is a political will situation. And there's pressure being put on them to do that, and that is what we need to do, is we need to uh, get in touch with um, those who represent us and let them know that we actually are willing, that it's time, that the scale of the challenge um, is is a collective challenge and that we're kind of willing to do this thing together that's what we need to do individually rather than just say okay that's okay but just not it, it can't touch me because it's going to have to touch us all and it's better that it do that and we actually participate in that uh, than we just keep pushing it on to those who haven't got the same power as we do yeah. wow that's um that's a way better answer to the public part that I was going to come up with, so I can skip that entirely. I uh, think that's, that's brilliant. So I'll focus on the students, um, because one of the things I love most about this job right now is going up in front of students to talk about this, because if there's two things that a student wants to hear about, it's hope and jobs. <laughs> right? I mean, the young people suffer from climate anxiety. Old people do too. I, I guess I'm kind of older now. I definitely do, but young people, you know, they really feel it. And so hearing about science that is attached to solutions and hope uh, and seeing them come up to me afterwards and talk to me about that and the excitement it, it gives them is, is unparalleled to any marine chemistry talk I've ever given in the past. Um, so so that's, that's, that's one thing. And then the jobs that that this creates, as, as you two have already alluded to, are really, you can come into the climate space from anywhere. And our, we often talk about origin stories in our company, like where, where have we come from? There's only about 16 people in our company and everybody's come from the most bizarre backgrounds. You know, uh, former nurses, former tech, uh, tech developers, software engineers, and, and so you can join the sort of fight against climate crisis from really anywhere. And I think that excites students as well, because I think that's the one place that they want to be, is they want to be in, in this fight. They want to put their, their expertise or their, their drive behind that particular problem. And you know, one of the um, jobs that you might not think, you know, we're going to need artists too. Who's going to build that placard for me on the Halifax Harbor waterfront? I'm not going to do it. I have no artistic ability whatsoever. So, you know, there's, there's, you know, it spans every discipline. And, um, and so it's, you know, bring the students, uh, you know, come talk to me because there's a lot, there's a lot of opportunity in this space, not just with our company, but, but other parts too. And um, just for those who think um, that that was broad. Um, I started off as a music student in instrumental violin <laughs> and uh, ended up in forestry for a while and then became a professional um, engineering professor and then ended up here um, with ocean. I did, I did a PhD in oceanography along the way somewhere, but I'm just saying, um, I just to agree completely with Will that um, all we, it's it all hands on deck as the, the questioner mentioned, it is all hands on deck and that means all disciplines and all skills and all people, all types of people. And I think that's perhaps where we have 
fall f sort of failed a little bit in the past is sending that signal it, it seemed like it's just a tech problem or it's a, just a data problem or it's uh, and and it's not it's a it's a problem for everyone um, please come talk to all of us we'd love to hear from you and uh, we'd love to share more about what we're doing our big ambitions with transforming climate action as the big research proposal and the North Atlantic Carbon Observatory is a transformative concept for unifying observation globally um, we'd love to talk more about all those programs, come support us. And let's together transform climate action.